What is up, engine heads? Today I will show you how and why to equalize the volume of your combustion chambers. First, we'll explain the why, and then I'll show you how. As you may know, your engine's compression ratio is the relationship between the largest and smallest volume of your cylinder. The largest volume is achieved when your piston is at bottom dead center, while the smallest volume is achieved when the piston is at top dead center. This obviously means that your smallest volume practically equals the volume of your combustion chamber, which means that your compression ratio is strongly influenced by your combustion chamber volume. If our total cylinder volume at bottom dead center is let's say 500 cc and our combustion chamber volume is 50 cc, then our compression ratio is obviously 10 to 1. If we increase the volume of our combustion chamber by only 5 cc, which is just 10%, then our compression ratio becomes 9.01 to 1 or 9 to 1. As you can see, an engine's compression ratio is strongly influenced by changes in the chamber volume. But who cares? Combustion chamber volumes never change. They're fixed from the factory and you can't do anything about it. Well, if you're building a performance engine, that's not actually true. There's some good incentives to modify your combustion chamber if you're seeking to improve your engine's performance and ensure its optimal operation. For example, you may want to remove casting imperfections and smooth and sharp edges in your combustion chamber to prevent them from turning into hot spots and causes for pre-ignition. You may also want to deshroud your valves, or in other words, remove material around them to enable better airflow. You may also simply want to remove material to increase combustion chamber volume in order to reduce your compression ratio if you're doing a forced induction build, for example. But even if you don't plan to modify your combustion chambers in any way, it's still a good idea to make sure their volumes are equal in a performance engine. Although combustion chamber volumes will be very close to each other on a stock cylinder head, they may not be perfectly equal because there's no effort made in the factory to ensure they are. This means that the extent to which the volumes are equal is determined solely by the consistency of the castings and the accuracy of the machining, which may not always be perfect. So let's say we have a four-cylinder engine. Chamber 1 is 55 cc, chamber 2 is 52, chamber 3 is 53, and chamber 1 is also 55. This means that compression in cylinder 1 and 4 is 9 to 1, but compression in cylinder 2 is 9.6 to 1, and compression in cylinder 3 is 9.4 to 1. This means that cylinder 2 will have the best performance, but it will also be the most likely to start knocking first. If it knocks and you don't have cylinder selective knock control, this cylinder will constrain the performance of all the other cylinders. But even with cylinder selective knock control, starting to knock sooner than the other cylinders is wasted performance potential and a less than optimal scenario. The optimal scenario for any engine is to always have as equal as possible performance from all of its cylinders. When it comes to my build, I have actually significantly modified my combustion chambers. My cylinder head is a 4AFE Toyota Economy cylinder head, which I'm planning to turbocharge. The valves were heavily shrouded, so I had to remove a lot of material to enable better airflow. This meant that I increased the volume of the chambers significantly. But this was also good because it enabled me to kill two birds with one stone because my compression ratio with the stock chambers was too high for the boost I'm planning to eventually run. Of course, I was doing all of this modification by hand, which dramatically increased the chances of the chambers having large volume inequalities. Additionally, there was no way of telling what my new chamber volume was, which meant that I couldn't accurately calculate my new compression ratio. All of this meant that I had to somehow measure the new volume of my chambers to ensure that it was equal between the chambers. Now, if you live in the United States, you can easily buy combustion chamber CC kits, which enable you to do just that. Unfortunately, I'm in Europe and these kits aren't available here. Nobody wants to ship them internationally either because they're made from glass and they're super fragile. On top of this, they're kind of expensive and it's hard to justify their cost when you're an enthusiast that does this kind of work once in a boom moon. So to solve my problem, I decided to go the DIY route with a super simple solution using inexpensive supplies available anywhere in the world. The first step is obviously to finalize the shape of your combustion chambers. I like to finish things off at this stage with 300 to 400 grit sandpaper, and once you're happy with what your eyes tell you when it comes to chamber equality, we can proceed to the next step. The next step is getting a piece of thin, transparent plexiglass that is longer and wider than your cylinder head. Anything between 2 to 5 millimeters of thickness is fine. 
Next, we're going to install a set of dummy spark plugs and then we're going to overlay the plexiglass over our chambers and mark the position right above the spark plug if your spark plug is located centrally like this. If the spark plug is not at the middle of the chamber, then you can simply eyeball and mark the center of the chamber. Now we're going to drill out the four holes that we marked. An 8 or 10 millimeter drill bit will be fine for this. Now we're going to install all of our valves. We're going to smear the sealing surface on the back of each valve with Vaseline or petroleum jelly. We're doing this because we need the valves to actually seal and not let water pass them because we'll be later using water to measure the chamber volume. Next we'll need two syringes, a large and a small one. You can get these at pharmacy stores anywhere in the world for less than a dollar. The large one must be larger than the volume of your combustion chamber. My particular combustion chambers have a volume of 30.25 cc in stock form. The large syringe holds 60 milliliters. One milliliter equals one cc, which means that the large syringe is more than enough. The small syringe must be able to measure 0.1 or one tenth of a milliliter. In my case, the small syringe holds two milliliters total and has the proper gradation for one tenth of a milliliter. Now we're going to smear a thin layer of Vaseline around the outside of the combustion chamber. A little bit goes a long way here. Wipe away any excess as there must not be any Vaseline inside the chamber. This will obviously affect the volume and the accuracy of your measurement. Next we will place the plexiglass over our chambers and press it down to ensure the Vaseline seals away the perimeter of the chamber. Now we're going to use water to completely fill the chambers. Although we have marked the center of the chamber for our hole, in the case of many chambers, placing the hole on the center will make it difficult to completely fill the chamber as it can lead to the formation of air bubbles. These air bubbles can be difficult to get rid of without spilling the water, which is obviously unacceptable as it distorts the accuracy of your measurement. A solution that usually fixes this problem is to place the hole in the corner of each chamber. This will make it a lot easier to fill the chambers completely and accurately. We'll first fill the chambers completely to see approximately how much volume they have. We'll do this using only the large syringe as accuracy isn't paramount during this initial volume estimate. After doing this, I have found that all my chambers are somewhere between 35 and 36 cc. This means that I have increased the volume of each of my chambers by around 5 to 6 cc, which is a pretty substantial increase that significantly lowers my compression ratio. Once we have done this initial estimate, we will remove the plexiglass and restart the process. Because each chamber is around 35 cc, I will fill each chamber with exactly 34 cc of water. This time around, accuracy becomes paramount and your measurement will only be as good as your accuracy with the large syringe. Getting the exact amount of water into the syringe consistently requires a bit of patience, but if you do it properly, this process will have a pretty decent degree of accuracy. Always read the syringe by placing it on its end at a level surface and always ensure that the water level has fully stabilized and is even. Once you have the correct amount of water inside the syringe, inject all of it evenly and carefully into the chamber. Next, we're going to use the small syringe to fill the remaining volume of the chamber. Make sure to draw an accurate amount into the small syringe and make sure not to forget how much water you have drawn in and how much remains after injection. It helps to write these numbers down as you're working. We will fill the chambers completely until a small bubble of water forms at our hole and we will write down the final volume of the chamber. We will obviously repeat the process for each chamber. After measuring, I have found that my last two chambers are the same, but the first and second are not. This means that I must remove a bit more material from the first and second chamber to equalize them to my last two chambers. We will lift the plexiglass, and then evacuate all the water from the chambers and get our air dye grinder again. This is when your patience will be tested because it will take multiple attempts to get this right. You must be careful not to remove too much because this can get you in an endless chamber enlarging spiral. If you make the chamber larger than the largest one, you have to enlarge the previously largest chamber and this can be a real pain. Only remove a bit at a time and measure often. I had to grind and re-measure four times until I got all my cylinders equal at 36.6 cc. In total, the whole chamber equalization process took around seven hours because the measuring is super slow when you're trying to be as accurate as possible. 
Obviously, this process is accurate only to a tenth of a millimeter, which is less than what pro kits can achieve, but it's still perfectly adequate for enthusiast and home-built engines. Once all the chambers are equal, you can finish things off by polishing the chambers. I like to do this with a selection of sandpapers starting from rough grits and ending with super smooth 2000 grit sandpaper. This is also tedious work, but it's kind of satisfying to feel as the chambers become smoother and smoother. Obviously, polishing removes an absolutely minimal amount of material that doesn't really affect the volume. Doing this before equalizing the volumes doesn't work because you ruin the polish each time you grind away material. The logic behind the polishing is that it minimizes the chances of a hot spot, but it also makes it harder for carbon to build up on the chamber surface. Less carbon buildup is always good because it ensures consistent performance and compression ratio, and it also reduces the chances of a piece of carbon buildup falling off and acting as a hot spot for pre ignition. Although you can get a combustion chamber to a perfect mirror finish with zero scratches, doing that will take an eternity and the performance benefits of a mirror finish over something like a 400 grit finish are in reality very low if not negligible. My approach is to devote a total of maybe 2-3 to three hours to the fine sanding of all the chambers to get most of the scratches out. And then I finish things off by polishing the chambers with a polishing compound. I first use a rough fast cutting compound and then a fine one. This takes another 30 to 45 minutes for all the chambers, after which I call it a day. It looks pretty shiny on camera, however there are still some small visible scratches in there. But perfecting things beyond this point has zero effects for the engine and only serves an aesthetic purpose, which makes it a waste of time I guess, because once you bolt the head on, you won't be seeing those chambers again. And here we have all four chambers equalized and polished, which brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found it informative and useful, and I hope it helps you in case you decide to do something like this yourself to ensure optimum performance for your engine. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.